update on where we're at with the marina. As you know, uh, you approved the purchase of the marina um, back in the fall, and we'd like to give you an update. This is what it currently looks like. And to give you an update, we've done some things internal to uh, the city's departments to clean it up and to just try and get it to a, a place that we're comfortable with at the moment. We have removed some of the fencing and relocating it. We're working on getting a new one in there that Glenn Futrell with FMS is working on a nice, uh, a nice fence that we're going to put up. We've also demolition of the bays behind the building. We've cleaned up some of the surrounding uh, debris and some other uh, stuff adjacent to the building. So we've also done, with the help of Pat Donovan Potts, done some minor repairs to some piling. So you'll see some pictures. If you can see in this picture the area, I'm not good with the pointer, but the area to the left there, that flat cement is where one of the bays has been removed. That was removed uh, internally through the FMS uh, and Allen and his guys. They did a good job with cleaning that area up. Uh, if that's a better picture of it. So that now has been cleaned up. Uh, this fence is the one that's going to be coming down. Once we get a new fence that's built and installed, it's going to go closer to the, to the water. So if you move forward towards the boats, we will put a fence connecting the property line to the building there so that nobody can necessarily access the boats and the water, but they'll be able to at least see through that, that barrier. Chain, chain link. More than likely, or nicer. No, it, uh, I don't remember whether we have a picture of it in not. here or not, but it's it's definitely not chain link. Okay. It's not chain link. It's something that Dr. Woodruff. Um, sort of a picket look, look to it. No, no. no it, it, something <laughs> different than that. Okay. Right. Actually, okay. actually, we we saw this on a recent visit at NC State where they <laughs> use it. Red, to, red and white fences. Oh, uh, something gonna like be, that. It's going to be beautiful. I thought okay. you got an expert on wrought iron fences, Mr. Mm -hmm. John over there. Um, so we're excited that that should be coming online. So uh, we did meet with our advisory committee a few weeks ago, and we asked for their input. We like to get their ideas and feedback, so we gave <laughs> them a, an aerial view of the, of the site, and we asked them to give us some feedback. So these are some of the suggestions they gave us. Um, as you can see, they were... They were um, a little bit a little bit of everything there so we were we were a little surprised about the concept of using some of the facility for a swimming area especially given the history of some of the uh, other activities or uh, wildlife that swims in the general area so not so sure that setting up a swimming hole down there is a good idea uh, we are going to be moving forward with a third party uh, contractor doing some kayak and canoe rentals there this summer so we're able to kind of put that in place now and these are some more suggestions um, also from the advisory committee. So moving forward, what we really need to do um, in order to get it to a place that's up to our city standards is what we're calling <coughs> phase one improvements. This is really going to address the bulkhead, which you'll see in a minute, the shape of the bulkhead, uh, putting in a boardwalk, and really putting uh, some floating piers, some finger piers, fixing what we have, and then a pump out station. So this right here is what we have as far as, uh, I don't know that you'd call that a current bulkhead, <laughs> but it is, um, it's holding, it's holding the land in. <laughs> but this is an area that I think first and foremost we need to address. So a bulkhead, obviously making sure that the structure is safe and um, this is another view uh, looking back into, into the marina. This is a picture looking into it. One of the things we'll be doing in the future is taking off the roof structure. So again, the idea is to open up this, the facility, let people see the water so that they can enjoy it and, and have a better visibility for what, for what it, the natural beauty is down there. So the roof structure will eventually come down and then repairing and if not replacing some of the, the piers that we have there, as you can see here. Yeah, the thought is that all of that, all of the structure that's there uh, really needs to be removed. You can see how narrow the finger uh, piers are. Uh, the concept will be to install floating uh, piers that are much wider. Right now, as you can see, the finger piers are, are literally on both sides of each slip. That's really a waste of space. You should double the size of the finger pier and then alternate so that they're not at, at both sides of each slip. You have, uh, you have that finger pier where it will serve boats on both sides and then two slips away you'll have that again. Uh, this, is, this is a um, 
a rough idea of what we'd like to do in the future. I'd like to focus your attention more so on the bottom half, which is really everything to do with the water uh, and all of the facility improvements that we really should make for that. So everything from the boardwalk to the bulkhead to the uh, slips to the gazebo out on the water is what we're calling our phase one improvements. So as we move forward in the next few minutes, you'll see for our grant opportunities, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be contained to the, this area. Future, future ideas, those are again future playground, future, those are all uh, things that are listed but not necessarily identified. Uh, we also wanted to show you some pictures of some other areas, local um, to this area and maybe others, just some ideas of what it could possibly look like. This is the floating, floating docks that Dr. Woodruff has referred to. The boardwalk is cement and then the fence line there is, is all is in the chain. Just some other pictures. This is similar to what we have a concept of on the outside on one of the piers to put a shelter, fishing area. Uh, moving forward, we'd like to just give you an update on our opportunities for grants. And one of the large grants that we're excited to be able to apply for is the uh, part of the Parks and Recreation Trust Fund grant. It is uh, being funded this upcoming year. Me and Michael went to a meeting this past week with the state representatives and they're saying for this upcoming fiscal year, it's a very, very healthy uh, funding source at seven million plus. So we feel like we have a good opportunity. When we spoke with the gentleman from the state, he thought this was a nice project. So we are comfortable in moving forward with an uh, opportunity of $350,000 with a match. That's just for the Parks and the part of uh, funding. And then we've also met with Pat Donovan Potts in getting her assistance with applying for a CAMA grant. The big project, which is boat, um, boat access or uh, something along those lines is for up to $200,000 with a 25 match and then a $20,000 grant for a pump out station. So between the two, we can apply for that amount. And then the nice thing is, is that 220 that you see there for CAMA will act as a match for our part if. So essentially we have a nice opportunity to really offset the city's, um, the city's match to go towards part if. So um, this is some of the things that we can apply for, both with PARDIF and with CAMA. As you can see, the bulkhead, uh, boardwalk, pump out, uh, shelter. Again, this is phase one, everything to do with the boardwalk and the uh, bulkhead in, with the water. These are some more pictures. Uh, this just illustrates, again, our uh, opportunities as far as funding sources, the city hopefully being um, the least with the part of at the most. Our opportunity total could be up to 900000 That's 700000 potentially with part if, 220000 with CAMA, and then a city's match of one hundred and thirty. Um, but that's just a, that's a broad best-case scenario until we move forward, we apply then we won't really know how it how it pans out. Obviously, a lot of it will have to do with uh, CAMA and what we end up applying for, but uh, the stars are aligning as far as our timelines go. The one for part of is due in May, and then CAMA is due in August. So um, the timing of it is nice. Normally, you cannot match uh, state money with state money on a grant, but because the funding source of the Coastal Area Management Authority or, or agency uh, money comes from a different source. We do have in writing from CAMA and from PARDAP that we can use the CAMA money to match the PARDAP money. You'll recall that previously you authorized a $500,000 grant for Phillips Park. Unfortunately, things didn't work out. On that grant, we, the city, were having to put up the $500,000 match. In this case, if we get a $350,000 grant from PARDAF, we have to come up with $350,000. But if we get the CAMA grant, that CAMA grant can now be used to fill part of that $350,000. So we believe that based upon the conversations that we've had in person, and the, com and the confirmation we have now in writing from both agencies that you're going to be able to 
improve somewhere in the vicinity of $700,000 of improvements with about 130,000 plus or minus of city <laughs> money. So it's 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 good if all of that works out. And right now it is the word if, but it looks pretty good. Richard, that money, do you think it'll cover the new bulkhead and the piers as <laughs> That's phase one, I guess. We're currently doing cost estimates. Uh, Deanna is doing the cost estimates, and uh, we will know. What we also know, though, is that there are various ways, for example, on the, uh, on the finger piers. Uh, you can make finger piers 30 feet long. You make them 60 feet long. Uh, so we will tailor the construction activities there to the amount of money that we actually have. In the Part F grant and the CAMA grant, they require you to identify elements, but they do not require you to identify the, what I'll call the actual dimensions of the elements. For example, we can put in the grant that we're going to put in finger piers. And if the money comes forward and we're able to put in 60 foot finger piers or only 30 foot finger piers, that's really not something that the grant cares about as long as you can show you put in the finger piers. One thing on the pump out uh, from the research and from the conversation with CAMA, there are no pump out facilities for any boats with holding facilities this far up the river. Now, they they were the ones who said, if you apply for that, we'll give you twenty thousand dollars to set up a pump out. That would be set up, uh, you know. Currently, I wouldn't encourage you to walk out on it, but there currently is a a uh, T dock that's out fairly far. All of that would come out and we're looking at a gazebo out there that would be a facility where you could moor and pump out and also you could load and unload tour boats such as the boat that uh, that is over at uh, Marina, Cafe. Yeah, Marina Cafe. So all of these are concepts. Uh, we're not asking you tonight to approve a site plan and definitely we want it understood that everything from the bulkhead out is what we're applying for grants for. Anything that's from the bulkhead in will come back to y'all for a master plan. But we do need, because of the amount of work needed to get the grant applications filed, we are asking for y'all to approve us proceeding with filing those grant applications. In the budget, we will be using the four cent fund to come up with the necessary match. And of course, that will own the, the actual award of those construction contracts will come back to you, as will the acceptance of the grants should they be issued. I'll move approval. Second. Any discussion? If you're not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> I'm not so sure that moving from waterfront property to Blue Frog is uh, an easy transition. But uh, Wally, if you're, you and your staff will come up and talk about the Blue Frog project. I mean, did you do that annotate for me? Can you handle that? Uh, <laughs> Greg, do you want to come up and... And Pete, why don't you and William also come up? I'll step back because I think it's important for you all to all be part of the discussion. So. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Mayor, Council. Um, tonight we're going to talk to you a little bit about the land treatment facility or land treatment site, LTS, as it's commonly known. Um, we're going to talk about Blue Frog, which is, I know you've heard a little bit about that and us referred to it in the past. And then at the end, I'll give you an update on where we stand with our lagoon levels and emergency spraying. So with that, just an overview to orient everybody to the site. Um, this is the um, treatment area and um, storage lagoons at the land treatment site. And of course, from here, wastewater comes in, comes up the headworks, it's kind of hard to see, but that's this area right in here. And then it goes through aerated lagoons, and that essentially, those two pieces are our treatment process. And then from there, it's sent to the 
west east storage lagoon or the south storage lagoon and our working lagoon is actually the west lagoon and we can pump out of the west lagoon and send it to the 20,000 plus sprinklers that we have out in the forested areas so from there we're going to zoom in on the treatment portion um, again headworks is right here all of the wastewater in the city comes through that area um, that's essentially where we feed some chemicals and we remove grit grease and then we split the flow and send it through the three trains and you can see that the three trains consist of six lagoons um, three small lagoons and then three larger lagoons um, tonight we're going to focus on train two and we've got those labeled as cell a which is the small pond and then b c and d and i'll get into those a little bit more why that um that lagoon is actually separated into three cells but for tonight's we're going to focus on that one lagoon so this is um i mentioned that we have aerators this is just a picture when you go out there this is what you see um we have four aerators and the small each of the small uh cells and then in the, in the larger lagoon, we have six. So um, the purpose of the aerators are to basically organically treat the uh, wastewater. We have um, the aerators essentially feed dissolved oxygen, which um, treats organic matter and um, uh, basically breaks down the ammonia nitrogen to nitrates and nitrates, which is far above my level. And um, the big thing it does is it settles out the residuals, the, the sludge that we have. So the purpose is to actually those three things, but settle out the sludge. Well, in the design of um, LTS, we realized that we were going to have to deal with sludge. So we focused it. Um, cell A, the, the smaller pond that we talked about, is essentially completely mixed. The idea is that we get little sludge to settle out in that, um, in those holding cells. And basically, we have four very large horsepower, they're 50 horsepower each, um, aerators in those, and they run all the time. Um, from there, it then moves into that larger lagoon I talked about where we were going to split it up into three cells. So we have B, C, and D. Um, we have six aerators. Uh, we don't run all six all of the time. It, a lot of it depends on um, weather. Um, you'll see that we'll run more in the summer, and during this time of the year, we may run less. And if you notice in that first picture, really only three of them showed up very well. Um, so the wastewater comes in from the top, and basically it had these uh, these lagoons have three cells that are created by full depth um, baffles so it forces the wastewater to go around and make its way before it gets out which increases our holding time and our contact time a little bit um, this is also the area where we focus on settling out some of the sludge so when we have to deal with the sludge um, this would be the area where we focus on dealing. And as I mentioned, we have three of these. Three, in the three trains, we have three of these. So. How deep is that? Feet, yeah. 15 feet. 15 yeah. feet. So, as, as I mentioned, the we plan on having to handle the sludge um, in this area. Right now, in the design, we're based on a, about a five-year cycle. Um, the last time we dredged was in 2011, so we're really close to that five years. Um, but one of the things that we found is that the sludge actually accumulates faster than what they expected in the design. So when we looked at, as I mentioned, we're, we're right at that five-year mark. We started, um, I actually challenged Pete to look at what other um, alternatives there are, and he and William got together. And this is one of the things they came up with. Um, it's actually a, um, it's called bio dredging. And the idea is that basically 
you digest the sludge in place instead of having to mechanically remove it. And when I say mechanically remove it, that means you drain that lagoon down, you take it offline, drain it down, and you go in there and you scoop it out, you haul it to a farm somewhere, and the farmer tills it under. And of course, then those crops are limited, or he's limited at what he can grow, um, which takes, every time we do that, it takes special permitting and it's very expensive. Um, so the technology that they found is basically an aerator. Um, and what it does, and quite frankly, it's um, a new process and there's not a lot of engineering calculations that support this. Um, but what we've, what we've found is in other sites that we've toured, it actually works. Matter of fact, one of the sites that William and I went to, um, the operator told us that they had to drag it into the pond with a tractor because the sludge was so deep. They couldn't even float it out. Um, but the idea is that it has um, basically lateral uh, mixing. Instead of throwing the water off in the air, it moves it across the surface, which helps create these seeds that sink down into the sludge and basically break it up and it creates an anaerobic zone at the bottom. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But here's one of the units in operation. So if you compare this with the picture I showed a few minutes ago, you can see that, you know, essentially the water is just moving laterally across the surface and it creates this, um, it, it creates this surface zone of aeration and then it creates an anaerobic zone underneath. So this is what that looks like. Um, so you have this, um, what they call the horizontal mixing zone, which is right where the water's coming out, and it, it basically reduces the surface tension. And um, as the seeds settle down and um, get into the sludge, it basically causes the sludge to break down, the granules start to float up, and the gas portion of that, as it hits this change in density, the gas escapes and what's left floats back down. And at the bottom, it creates an anaerobic zone that essentially is supposed to, the sludge eats itself. That's what's supposed to happen. So um, that sounds great. Why, why are we looking at a pilot program? Why are we just not implementing this across the board? Um, and the reason is you know, they've shown in other places that we've seen that they can greatly reduce the sludge. Matter of fact, um, I think the one that we toured, um, the, um, they had been in place about two years, and they had gone from four or five foot in depth of sludge down to less than 18 inches, um, which is very impressive. That did not include any mechanical dredging. That just includes setting the, setting the aerators in place and letting them work. However, admittedly, that was a much smaller facility than what we have, on the order of about 300,000 gallons, and we average um, 300,000 gallons a day, and we're averaging closer to five and a half million gallons a day. Um, their, their contact time was a lot longer, so we have some reservations. Um, however, the good thing about these is, I mentioned that we have, you know, six aerators, the ones that we're looking at replacing are about 10 horsepower. And these are much smaller horsepower, so there could be a, or there will be a savings in electrical cost. Um, Can I ask so, a question? Sure. Again? What, are you in any kind of replacement period for any of those aerators? No, but some of them are 20 plus years old and we repair them. You know, we've had to replace motors and rewind them. And those so you don't have a replacement cycle for this? It's, a, it's constant, okay. basically. Those are the original ones? Those are the original ones, yes, sir. So we have, um, this is the existing layout that I mentioned. So we have six 10 horsepower aerators, total 60 horsepower. The full depth battle, uh, baffles that I talked about, that forces the wastewater to go around um, to prevent it from short-circuiting the treatment process. Um, with Blue Frog, this is the design proposal that they've given us. You can see that um, they are, the intensity is great. We have, we're looking at 14 total, 
to have nine up in this initial area where the wastewater comes in. Um, the green lines that you see there represent two curtains that they're proposing to install. Those curtains would go all the way across the lagoon, but would not go full depth. They were, I think they were 48 inches. Um, and the idea there is that it forces the wastewater to go down into that anaerobic zone and come back out. And then you can see in, at the end of the lagoon, they've got this quiescent zone. Um, and again, what they're, what they're telling us is that they can significantly reduce our um, sludge. And initially they were talking down to about 18 inches to two feet or so. Um, right now we are um, just above four feet. Um, actually that was as of um, last, last, summer. last summer, we were at four feet. We had a survey done of the sludge levels in um, this train. So um, Greg talked to DEQ, as I mentioned, it's um, a newer technology. There's not a whole lot of engineering calculations that differ from what we have in the um, past. Um, so going through this information with DEQ, they've actually um, approved a two-year pilot program. They'll do it as a maintenance activity, which means we do not have to modify our permit. Um, we will have to do pe periodic uh, sampling of the aerated lagoons. As I said, we're focusing on train two right now. So um, we will have direct comparison of our other two um, of our other two trains so that we can compare water quality um, as well as what happens at sludge to the sludge and we will look at the sludge depth um, periodically as well. Two yes questions. sir. Is this in use in some other facility that might be comparable to ours in terms of? No, sir. We would be the largest. Um, they have, they don't have any of this technology in North Carolina at all, so we'd be the first in North Carolina. They have two in Georgia, which are the two plants that we went and toured. Um, one was um, an irrigation facility, and the other was um, typical, typical ter tertiary treatment. Um, they have several in California that are um, under a million gallons a day, but no, sir, we would be the largest. What's the cost benefit? Well, I'm glad you asked. Our initial inv investment is somewhere around $290,000. That's for this one train. Um, compare that to the estimate that we had. Of course, this was for all three of these um, larger cells in the trains. Um, was over 500,000. Well, so sludge for, for mechanically, for removing as we have in the past. How much? Over 500,000. So, so stop it, dry it. That's correct. It. Yeah, so, and you know, the, so the initial investment here for one is larger than if you took the over 500 and divided it by three. <laughs> However, the long term, um, there could be significant savings. We think at some point we may have to mechanically remove sludge because not 100% of our sludge is organic. We do have some inorganic matter like sand and grit that gets into our um, aerated lagoons. So at some point we will have to do something with that. But um, you know, even if that is 20 or 30%, we could extend the life of our lagoon significantly. So you have the same sludge problem in each of the three lagoons? Yes, sir. And it was that was the intention of the design. So really your your costs are a lot higher than what you told us. Well that would remove that but that's a one time removal. In five years we'll be looking at more than five hundred thousand dollars again. The last time we did it was in um, two thousand eleven and we did two of them, and they were 300,000, over 300,000 to do. No, 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 total, 300,000 total. But with that, I can tell you, um, I know Mr. Massey was part of that, and um, we had some interesting situations with the contractor that was hauling the sludge away. As a matter of fact, I think something happened on the road and he ended up dumping it on a car or something. So it does create challenges. Is the, the buildup larger in that middle pond? Is that what you're saying? 
No, the um, in the survey we had done, um, it was fairly clo close across the three. Um, I think the largest was in the first train, and the reason is we didn't actually dredge it. It was fairly new. Um, you know, it came online in 2009. It came online in 2009, and we were dredging the other two in 2011, so it was fairly new. So there's a little bit more in train one, but being in train two, it... You know, it gives us a good comparison on both sides. Um, yes, sir. Is there any uh, assurance or any guarantees that they're providing as part of this initial process? There is. Um, they have, they've basically said that they would give us, refund our money if they could meet the agreed upon um, removal level. And I think that was 75%. Everything except the oh. engineering fees. So they would... If that if it doesn't remove down to eighteen inches, is that my? I don't I don't know. What was we, have come, I, okay. we have to come. We have to. So there is some them. sort of assurance that they're willing to to agree to. Um, they, I guess that shows that there has to be some ability for this stuff to work. That's correct. And um, you know we, they said seventy five percent, but we are we're going to have some cost on our side too. Right. Because we're the ones that are doing the electrical work, so we'll have to. They'll pu su supply the cabinets, but we've got to buy the wiring and those kind of things. And so we will have some cost. And all that? Those curtains. I'm sorry. They put in all the curtains. And yes, everything? they'll assist us with install installation. Um, so part of the way we're going to keep the cost down is for our staff to do a large portion of the installation, but they will be on site to assist. One of the reasons why they are. One of the reasons why they would like to move to a facility our size is, as Wally said, they've only Sinos. proved the technology in small areas. If they can prove this works in a plant our size, it opens up a market that is phenomenally large. Yes. And likewise, you know, when we look at this, we have the potential to save a lot of money, but John, of course, is going to be involved in the legal documents that document what is it that actually not just promising but legally contractually are going to be obligated to so there is the potential that if it works if it does not work then there'll be remedies that we will have to uh, make sure in the contract well in implementing this would make us uh, put us in a position to have to do away with what we got out there now though, right no actually the advantage is we can go back very easily to our old setup we're gonna keep the aerators clean them and store them and if we have to reinstall them it'll just be a matter of rewiring so it'll be a fairly easy process if we need to switch is back this a new startup company or are they large they they are not large um i think they've been in business eight years yep, something. something like that and i think the the one of the lagoon one of the uh treatment plants we looked at had they they have been operating for about three years and um one thing i'll say is you know i've kind of mentioned this a couple of times when we've talked but i um a lot of credit to the to the sales team that blue frog has they set up the meeting, they showed up, and when we got there and they made the introductions, they left. They left us with the operators of those facilities. Um, and when we were done at both of them, my comment to the chief operator was, you almost sound like a Blue Frog salesman, and they said, no, but we are believers. So um, in both cases, they had success. So we're, we're hoping that we would see the same. Um, as the next step, you'll see because this is a, a new technology and there's not a lot of competition, of course, we want to specify what we get. Um, you'll see on your 22nd agenda if we can get it prepared faster than that, and I think there is some advertising requirements, you'll see a sole source um, agenda item um, for your consideration. Um, with that, if you'll give me two more minutes. Just an update on where we are currently. I know that Dr. Woodruff has sent out emails updating you on LTS. Um, but on February 9th, our lagoons reached freeboard. Um, it was actually the West Lagoon that reached freeboard. Explain um, that term again. Freeboard is... Um, 
to go in and with basically so, so many feet <laughs> of the top of the lagoon. Yes, there's um, two feet. Two, there two you go, feet two feet. feet. The, the top um, of the lagoon. So with that, we, you know, obviously we have to maintain those levels. So we had to enter emergency spraying, which means we can spray whether it's rain or shine. Um, and of course, that'll continue until we deem um, that, you know, we are comfortable enough that we can discontinue emergency spraying. Um, just to give you an update, uh, this is the last six months of lagoon levels and rainfall. Um, we provide this information to our water and sewer advisory board on a monthly basis. Um, but you can see back in August, we were, you know, between five and six feet across the board, which um, I can tell you we hadn't been there in the last two years. So we were, real, we were at really good levels. Um, then, of course, we faced um, significant rainfall since then. And um, just as a snapshot, right before we went into, right before our lagoons hit freeboard, um, from Thursday, February 4th to Monday, February 8th, we had set over seven and a quarter inches at LTS. So that was straight rainfall into the lagoons. And then our influent levels from the city total over that same time period was 61.9 million, which um, averaged out over what, 11 or 12 million a day. Um, so, you know, as you can see, we were we already had, in, you know, elevated lagoon levels, and the last rainfall just really hurt us. And then, um, of course, this morning we had a lot of rain, and we had about an inch and a quarter at LTS. Well, they go back uh, two slides, please. I've got slides right there. I'm sorry. Okay. That's fine. Uh, Pete, talk, you and William talked a minute about uh, the number of spray days we've lost recently. William has he has actually has documentation there. If we give him a second to get it, it'll be a whole lot more accurate than trying to go from memory. A lot of numbers dancing in our heads. <laughs> okay, this uh, documentation covers November through February 9th. Uh, during that three month and nine day period, our average influent was 7.2 .7, million gallons a day. Our average effluent, which is what we discharged to the field, was 3.7 million gallons a day. Uh, rainfall total average was 25.5 inches, with a total loss or a total loss of irrigation days of 35 days. So, how many days did your accounting period cover? Uh, November, December. November, November, December, January through February 9th. So let's just say 100 days, roughly 100 days, and how many days did you lose? We lost 35 days. <clears throat> and part of the challenge is on the days we're actually losing irrigation, we've got elevated influent to the land treatment site because it's raining in the city. I do want to, uh, to compliment uh, Pete and William. They are your leadership team at the LTS. The daylighting that William and his crews are currently doing out there, we have sent you pictures. Daylighting means the irrigation, um, what do you call them? The uh, laterals. Laterals. The irrigation laterals opening up, uh, cutting everything back. It has greatly improved the evapotranspiration that occurs out there, the sunlighting that occurs, the daylighting is essential. I know that we have talked before about having a workshop. We hope that uh, once it does quit raining, where it's just not overly muddy out there, that we're able to get you out there. I think you're going to be pleased with the harvesting, but more importantly, you're going to be pleased with just the overall operation. And while we're talking about blue frog and we're talking about these things, uh, the management that uh, Pete and William are giving out there, I'm very proud of, is professional, and I wanted to commend them in front of you tonight. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So we'll be one of the first in the state with the blue frog. You'll be, you will part. be the first, first in the state. Yeah. 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 You know, give cause for maybe changing the state license plate motto. Yeah. 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 You know, blue blue frogs, blue devils, blue frogs. You know. First in flight. Boy, that that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Blue devils, blue frogs. Blue frogs. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, I kind of lost my place as to where <laughs> just the thought of, of that. Okay. Uh, we would like to give you uh, a quick update regarding uh, diversity. And John is going to uh, take the lead on a lot of this. So, John, if you would, please. You want to? I think I'll do that. <clears throat> Slides a little different than that one, but that's okay. Uh, here we go. It's always an honor to speak to you, Mayor and Council, but when I can speak to you about the School of Government and my association with them over the years, it's especially uh, rewarding. Uh, and since I have a little time, I will tell you a little bit about that. I, 1973, between going from undergrad school to law school, I was one of a very few number after going through a vetting process to become a North Carolina state government intern. That program doesn't even exist today because of monetary considerations. But being uh, in that program was planted me in Raleigh for that summer to work in the Supreme Court Library and to have contact with uh, in settings like this, very close intermit with Robert Morgan, the Attorney General, Terry Sanford, uh, who was at that time president of Duke University, et cetera, et cetera. It was just a wonderful opportunity. Of course, then I went to law school and ended up at the DA's office, and who did we look to and call upon? And that, again, was the School of Government. The School of Government is a resource that many states do not, does not have. Albert and Gladys Coates, who I'll mention again in a moment here, and I was honored at one time to meet them, were such visionaries to even have this con concept of where elected leaders could be touched by this program called the School of Government. Each of you have been touched. Each of you have gone to the essentials of municipal government, uh, in Wilmington, most of them, maybe in other places. Uh, in addition to that, each of you get your uh, ethics training through the School of Government. Your League of Municipalities, one of their primary partners, is the School of Government that helps with education. Carmen's Association, my association, uh, we absolutely depend upon the School of Government to put together courses and, and presentations for us and so forth. There's not a week, and I've already sent my first email to them this week, there's not a week that I don't email some professor up there because I'm certainly not an expert in, in any and everything. Uh, at all. I just know who to call on to get that kind of advice. But they are certainly a wonderful resource. And so when Richard and uh, I talked about the diversity discussion that y'all had here at the table, and certainly from that discussion it was made clear, as I think Mr. Uh, uh, Willingham would say, there were triggers, uh, as I believe was a term that was used, that indicate that we need to look at ways to better have diversity in at least some areas, uh, being in police, fire, and upper management, if you will. So based upon that, uh, I decided to make some contact with the School of Government. And this uh, lady here, her name is Leisha DeHart Davis. She's the Albert and Gladys Hall Coach Distinguished Term Associate Professor. And again, they don't just throw these names on folks. Uh, all of them don't have a name like that. She is a, a, a respected person in her area of expertise. And just one of the th courses that she taught, teaches is, of course, uh, is on diversity and inclusion. So we gave her a call and had a long conversation with her. And she was glad that we reached out to her. And she said, this is just such an opportune time for y'all to call. She said, diversity, inclusion, is something that is, the students are just talking about here on campus because it is, you know, they're concerned about that kind of concept here on campus. And through that conversation, she says, I'm getting ready to have my folks, and she takes care of uh, the Master's in Public Administration program. I'm getting ready to have them do a, a project for me. And said, so I'd love for y'all to put in a paragraph, what you'd like to see. And so we, Richard and I did that, and again, talking again about P1, 2, and 3, and firefighters and upper management, I'd like you to look at uh, diversity uh, analysis and barrier analysis in reference to that. And so these three folks here came forward, and they signed up for the program, and we've had contact with them. But I think it's worthwhile for just a moment here for me to tell you a little bit about these folks, because these young people are, are the best and the brightest. The first one there is Angel Angelica Arnold. Angelica is, again, uh, in the uh, Master's of Public Administration. She is a, um, graduated from UNC Chapel Hill. 
She's been involved with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Share Our Strength, which is a program that is ending, uh, working toward ending childhood uh, hunger, and she's now the uh, program assistant for the campus health services there. Dylan Russell. Dylan was president of his uh, Appalachian State University uh, uh, class there, student body president. He's also now president of the uh, student body, the graduate student body at UNC. But if, and he took off a year and taught after he left uh, Appalachian State. And also in, during that period of time, he went to President Obama and worked in the White House, where there he was involved in the uh, Office of Presidential Personnel doing exactly what we're asking him to do. How you make the president's staff and office, and that, as you know, is a huge, broad subject, how you make it reflect the color of our nation. So again, Dylan uh, is originally from Boone. The other young lady who is our real contact person, that's Stephanie Watkins Cruz. Stephanie uh, was uh, from UNC Asheville. She was president of the Black Student Association there. Uh, she's involved in uh, the, the first, She's the First is a scholarship program for girls in low-income uh, countries and also involved in America's Promise Alliance, which is a program that has been begun by General Colin Powell to help children and youth from all socioeconomic backgrounds. So again, we're talking about the folks that will be working with us here on this program uh, as I, I consider to be you know, involved in some very important uh, things and have been uh, some good background. The, uh, they told us what they needed from us. Uh, and so we have sent through them with the help of our HR department uh, a whole list of things. And I'll just go down a, a few of them here. Of course, job descriptions for the upper management and the P1, P2, P3, F1 and F2, firefighter F1, F, F2, three-year review of hiring for police and fire, three-year review hiring of top management, uh, again, where do we advertise this for specific journals, et cetera, magazines, uh, current retention rates for police and fire, professional development that's been offered by the city for fire and uh, the police. And so based upon that, they are now have, have taken that and they're working on that. We actually have a uh, memorandum of understanding, uh, MOU, like we have with the county with these folks that Richard and I have signed, where their job is to determine the best practices <clears throat> for the city of Jacksonville for workforce diversity. They're to explore best recruitment and website practices from comparable jurisdictions nationwide to help us do a better job in that area. To analyze the gender and racial demographics of the city and to identify and to replicate and to, or to, to identify any kind of elements of, uh, that would be a barrier to having a more diverse uh, workforce. The, and one of the nice things in this, Mr. Thomas, is totally free. Uh, there's no cost to the city of Jacksonville. Uh, this is part of their project. They're willing to uh, not only uh, draft a report for us to review as far as management and myself, but also to uh, give a presentation to council. We haven't got that down to the final uh, details yet, whether it would be Skyped in or however you do those things or actually make a trip down here. But uh, they're very interested and look forward to working on this project. Timelines are uh, up here. Uh, basically in April, they will uh, get to us and we'll have some conversations with them prior to that to see, make sure we've supplied everything they need, but uh, a draft report to us. And then again, so their uh, a presentation uh, to, uh, to mayor and council in May. Maybe so, working under the supervision of that professor. Yes, sir. This will be, and this again, uh, that this will be a presentation, a class presentation for them there. And you know, there's, they're not going to publish this. I mean, there's all kind of, things here we're not going to you know but again what we've told them is public record as far as retention levels and things of that nature but this is the areas they're going to be looking at again i won't repeat myself the uh here on the police and the firefighters and so forth uh, of course i think it's been identified at this table there's some issues in both the fire and the police department as far as making trying to get a more diverse population and again even with the upper management team i think that's where there's some discussion about triggers and so forth there's no openings there at this point in time but again, it's a great opportunity when you don't have an opening to actually look and see what things you can do better when an opening does come forward. So this is our uh, plan and this is our passion to try to do the very best we can for you to, uh, as far as giving you this kind of information so that it can help you and help the management in particular to do a better job in, uh, in the future in, in these areas of employment. I have a question, Mayor, because we had some discussion about this at the League as well. 
one of the questions is is how, how do you define diversity and what do you think that should what is your definition of diversity and I think that that needs to be clearly defined is what do you consider a diverse workforce is it uh, all Italians all Americans all white all black and that was a good conversation that we had and I think that needs to be part of a discussion yes. is what do you how do you define diversity and what should that look like in a workplace what should that make up I'm sure that'll be because that may be different for different companies or it may be a, a, a the same Yes. Well, it is different for different communities. Yeah. There's no question. So I think that should be part of the you know discussion in terms of how do, how do we define diverse and how, what should that makeup look like? I think it'd be nice to have an independent review and see what they recommend or suggest. Thanks for putting that together. Yes, sir. Thank you. That saves a considerable amount of money, too. Well, again, I, I commend John for taking the leadership to make the contact with the School of Government. We believe that it will be a productive effort and we look forward to hearing their report. Great job. And we will keep you updated. So. All that right, concludes the else? three items that we uh, had for uh, the workshop. Uh, we apologize for letting you out a little early tonight, but we weren't sure how long the discussion on the marina or on the diversity or on the uh, land treatment would take. But uh, that concludes our items. Everything was good, succinct, uh, very good presentations. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the workshop. So moved. Second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye.